We're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 1. Let's begin at verse 10. This is a message related to pleasing God. And that's really what we want to do is we want to please Him. So beginning in uh, Galatians chapter 1 at verse 10. And I'll read to verse 12. Paul writes, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, as we've been looking at Galatians, we just began our study. You might remember, as I pointed out to you, that false teachers have infiltrated the churches in the region called Galatia. In church history, these individuals are called Judaizers. And their chief aim was to mix the gospel of grace with the Jewish ceremonial and ritual law. So they were mixing the law of Moses with the grace of Jesus Christ as is revealed to us in the gospel. And, and the result of such a mixture was bondage. And the reason that it is bondage is because when you mix the law with God's grace, it undermines the grace of God. And Paul was intensely concerned about this. Uh, that's what was fueling his comments that we looked at in verses 6 through 8, where he said there, I marvel that you are turning away. When he says you are turning away, that's in a Greek tense that means you are voluntarily turning yourselves away. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And that's a very strong statement to come from the man who wrote 1 Corinthians 13 and taught us about love. So he's greatly concerned about what was going on. These individuals coming in were going to steal the joy of salvation from these Gentile believers. They were going to steal it by saying to them that they needed to become circumcised and understand the law of Moses so that they could relish the grace of God. And, and he was concerned about this because they were voluntarily deserting God and embracing a twisted or a perverted message that was not a gospel. You see, what they were doing is they were playing on something. The, their thought was that salvation is something that requires human assistance. It's just too difficult for us to believe in a God of grace and mercy. We need to do something to deserve this salvation. And so they brought that mentality in to add something to the gospel. Now that is a normal tactic. And part of the, the way the enemy works to undermine the truth of the gospel is, is he will cause a question to come concerning the grace of God. And, and the way he normally works is to under, undermine, we'll say, the message, is to first attack the messenger. And that's why Paul began, as we saw in chapter 1, that's why Paul began to refer to himself as an apostle, because they were questioning his apostolic credibility. They had circulated a report that, that Paul had no apostolic authority. They were saying that he was self-appointed. They were saying that his motivation is, is self-promotion. They were accusing him of laying aside the law of Moses to make it easier for Gentiles to become Christians. Thus, they, they were saying he was undermining God's law. And so what they were doing is they were sowing seeds of discord, and, and, and their sowing of these seeds actually worked. People began to doubt the authority of the apostle Paul. The questioning of his authority actually led to their doubting of his motives. And so Paul felt compelled to respond to these things. And that's why he says in verse 10, Do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? That's why he's saying that. When he says, Do I now persuade men, that word persuade uh, means to strive to please, to win somebody's favor. It speaks of gaining someone's goodwill. So he's saying, am I striving to please men? Am I striving to say things that cause people to look kindly at me and to like me? And then the answer, obviously, would be most certainly not. You see, one of the tactics of false teachers is a reluctance to present the whole counsel of God. People who don't want to really 
present the whole gospel of God will we'll conveniently leave out some things that may cause people to become uncomfortable, especially today. We see that today. There are well-known individuals that I, I, I will not mention by name, but, but were I to mention them, you would know their names who, who have constantly refused to, to, to give the whole counsel. They'll, they'll, give, they'll give pieces of the gospel, but they don't give the whole counsel. So some people may be genuinely believers who, who know that if they give the whole counsel, they're not going to fill the pews with people. And then there are others who, will, who intentionally will not give the whole gospel because they don't embrace the whole gospel. And, and a false teacher is one who doesn't embrace the whole gospel. And a false teacher very often is the one who wants to win people's favor. They want to win converts for themselves. They want people to follow after them. And so the bottom line is, is when you really teach the Word of God, a to Z, well, it will reveal our hearts. And, 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 and I have to be honest with you, some of the best messages that I've ever received have, have torn me apart, to be honest, have really revealed myself to me. I, I, that's, I don't want to walk in and say when, I, when I'm through, yeah, I'm a pretty good guy. I'd like to walk out saying, you know, there are areas of my life that God spoke to today. And there are things in me that I want to change. And I, and I hear that and I see that. And I want to be different. I want to be better. I want to be a better man. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father, grandfather. I want to be a better Christian. And, and, and I can see that when the Word of God is rightly divided, and it can be done so in a gentle, loving way, but it, when it's rightly divided, it opens my heart up. It gives me an opportunity. It's like the Lord sticks His hand into my chest and pulls my heart out and says, this is what it's really like. And that's called conviction. And people don't necessarily want to be convicted. They want to come and feel better about themselves and leave feeling better about themselves. But you have to sometimes see yourself for what you are before you can see yourself for what you can be. And conviction helps us to do that. And so what God would have for us in his word is the whole counsel, which helps us to see what the Lord wants. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the word of God is living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so a false teacher will not give the whole counsel because they don't want people to necessarily no longer follow after them. A great preacher of another time, a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon, once said this. He said, I have never preached to you that you may live in sin if you only believe in Jesus. I have never preached that you shall be saved without being purified in heart. No, the salvation that this pulpit has proclaimed is not salvation in sin, but salvation from sin. Not a license to evil, but a deliverance from evil. And that's the preaching of the gospel. And that's what the gospel is intended to do. So what happens is false teachers will enter in and undermine the grace of God. Now, Paul often had to deal with false teachers. One of the, the letters, or we call it books, but one of the letters that he wrote was, was uh, 2 Corinthians. And when false teachers entered into the church at Corinth, they lodged many accusations against Paul. When you read 2 Corinthians, you can actually, when you read with an eye to see this, you can actually see that Paul uh, has to answer some 21, at least 21 accusations that these false teachers had leveled against him. If you read 2 Corinthians carefully, you're going to see that many of the things that he's writing is actually a rebuttal against the false teachers who were calling into question his ministry and his heart, his motives, even the way he looked. And so 21 times you'll see in these 13 chapters, Paul having to rebut something that was said. And one of the accusations was that he was one who preached the gospel for personal and financial gain which was a common tactic of the false teacher at that time. And that's why Paul in 2 Corinthians 2.17 said, We are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. We don't alter the gospel. We don't make it something that the consumer will, will enjoy. He said, We're not trying to profit from this message of the gospel. The message has to be presented with a desire to honor and accurately communicate who God is. It's not to be modified to become acceptable to man, 
It's to be spoken to make man acceptable to God. And when Paul would give that word out, he spoke it with a clean conscience and he spoke it as it was being presented in a way that people would actually know God as a result of hearing what he had to say. When he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he said, As we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tries our hearts. And so that's what he's saying here to the Galatians when he says in verse 10 of chapter 1, Do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. When he says, if I still please men, that would refer to his days prior to his conversion, when he was a persecutor of the church. When he persecuted Christians, he was resisting Jesus, but he was pleasing the religious authorities. So he's saying, if I wanted to please men, I'd have never been converted. If I wanted to please men, I'd have remained what I was because I would have pleased them because Paul was a leading, a leading uh, rabbi of his day. He was an intellectual of intellectuals. He was a man who had very high standards of righteousness. He was respected by many. But he said, if I wanted to please men, I'd have stayed exactly what I was. In, in many ways, guys, if you wanted to please men, you'd have stayed unsaved because they'd have liked you. A lot more people probably liked you unsaved than they do now that you're saved. At least that's what happened to me. The friends that I had either were converted or deserted, you know, because they didn't like what I became, because I suddenly became a Bible thumper to them. I suddenly became a Jesus freak, is what we used to be called at that time. And, and you know, what happened to you? I can still remember my cousin saying to me exactly that. What happened to you? You used to be fun. You used to be enjoyable to be around. And he liked me when I was drunk or loaded. Yeah, that's true. Because I, I could be a lot of fun and very stupid. And he enjoyed that. But when I got saved, I changed. And so if I wanted to please men, I'd have stayed unsaved. Because they liked me that way. And that's basically what Paul is saying. If I wanted to still please men, I'd have never come to Christ. Because I was pleasing men when I was a rabbi persecuting Christians. And that's the point he's making. I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. But he goes on in verse 11, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. When he says, I make known to you, he's saying, I'm saying something. I certify this. I want this to be something that you can believe with absoluteness. I want to guarantee this completely. The message I am preaching is not something I have altered to suit my needs. This message that I'm preaching is not built on my own inspiration, and it doesn't rest on my human authority. He says in verse 12, For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this statement would be aimed at those who are trying to infiltrate the church, the Judaizers, because they had received their instruction from rabbis. They looked for human interpretation of the Word of God, and they leaned on man's traditions. And that's what he's pointing to. I didn't receive it from man, neither was I taught it. But what has happened with the uh, traditions of man had come corruption of the Word of God. And so Jesus, when he was speaking concerning that in Matthew 15, 6, speaking to the rabbis of his day, the Pharisees, who were doing exactly that, Jesus said, you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And so Paul is making it clear, I haven't received traditions and I'm not into rituals. He's saying, I wasn't taught it. In other words, I didn't sit under um, the leading rabbi whom he did sit under was Gamaliel. He's, he's saying, uh, I didn't learn the grace of God from, from Gamaliel. Neither did I uh, receive from the apostles uh, teaching concerning the grace of God that led to my getting saved. I, I didn't attend a class that was designed to instruct me concerning the love of God and the grace of God. I, I didn't go through that kind of institution. I, I wasn't brought to faith like that. But notice in verse 12, he says, it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the heart of the gospel. Jesus who's revealed in the gospel. Now, when Paul got saved, you know the story. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 9. 
Paul was a persecutor of the church. He hated this Christian doctrine with a passion that was unmatched. At that time, it was before Christians were referred to as Christians. They were simply followers of the way. And that's what the Christ Christianity originally was referred to as the way. And that's why Paul would say, I persecuted this way unto death because it was a way of life. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and so Christians were followers of the way. They were followers of Jesus Christ, who is life. And so when Paul was, was seeing what was taking place after the day of Pentecost had arrived and, and thousands were being converted to faith in Jesus as Messiah, well, Paul was one of these radical rabbis who was so absolutely upset at what was taking place that he actually went and got permission. He got letters from uh, the priest to, to be able to arrest anybody who was at one time a, a Jewish person who, who became a Christian. He, he was given a, a permission to do that, and they were, they were tried as heretics. And Paul was absolutely vehemently opposed to this grace of God. And so while he was on his way to the city of Damascus, we all know of this great conversion experience where he had gone to arrest Christians. He was arrested by Jesus, and he became blind because the Lord Jesus Christ struck him, and, and, and he, he lost his sight. And, and, and Jesus spoke to him and said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who am I persecuting? Well, when you persecute one of these who are mine, you are persecuting me. And then the Lord ministered to him, and, and for three days he was without sight, and he, and he didn't eat anything. And, and it was during those times that, that more than likely the Lord Jesus Christ was communicating to him the gospel. Now, you need to remember that because he was a rabbi. He, he understood the law very well. Undoubtedly, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he converted Saul, gave to him the insight into why the law was not leading him to salvation. And so Jesus ministered to him in that time period because when the Lord spoke to a man by the name of Ananias and said, go and pray for Saul, you know the story. Ananias wanted to instruct God and said, well, you know, God, I know you're busy uh, with the universe and there are quite a few things that are going on that perhaps this may have passed your, your attention, but this Saul whom you want me to go and speak to kills people. And I, I, you know, I'd rather you send somebody else because I'm pretty busy. He didn't want to do it. But the Lord said, uh, Lord God said, no, you go and, and, and you pray for him. And so when Ananias went and prayed for him, Ananias addresses Paul by saying, Brother Saul. And so that gives to us insight to, to the fact that Saul, in the, in, in the time that he was blinded, to the time that Ananias came and spoke to him, had received Christ as Messiah, and from that perspective, we know that when, when Paul is, is saying that, that he wasn't taught this, he's simply saying that I received this through the revelation of Christ who spoke to me and gave me insight into what it means to be a saved man. So he's giving his credentials here and explaining to people that I have discovered the heart of God is grace and mercy that comes through Jesus Christ. Before Paul was converted... I'm certain he was intellectually acquainted with the gospel. He knew that Christians believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew that they believed he had been crucified, that he died, he was buried and resurrected. He knew that. As a matter of fact, when you look at the book of Acts in chapter 7, if you take notes, it's found in verse 58, the death of the first martyr, Stephen, well, the Bible says that they cast him out of the city, they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So Saul was somebody who was there at the martyrdom of the, of the first Christian uh, martyr, Stephen. He was well acquainted with the gospel. He knew, but just because he knew didn't mean he embraced. So he knew certain things. Undoubtedly, the Lord Jesus Christ gave him more insight even as he spoke to him. And it took the Lord to convert him. That reminds me of the fact that we can be filled with knowledge of the Bible. You can be raised in a Christian home. You can have devotions from the time you were, you were a baby. You can be in Sunday school. You can be raised in a church from the time you were small until your present age. But that doesn't mean you're saved. 
because there's a certain point in your life where you enter into the light, if you will. You walk out of the darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. That's, I, I have a belief that there are quite a number of people who are going to be very surprised on Judgment Day because they thought themselves to be Christians when in reality they never really did commit themselves to Christ. They had a shallow kind of intellectual belief. They knew the facts. I mean, if you sat down and spoke to them, they'd say, yeah, I know. You know, I know this and I know that. I'm telling you, there's, there's some that I, I've spoken to a number of people over the years who, who have this understanding of grace that, that, is, that is warped, it's twisted. It, their idea of grace, and it's, it, it's, hurt, it's hurtful to say this, but it's true. Their idea of grace is not so much that God has given to them uh, an ability through his power to, to be saved and to, be, to no longer be in bondage, but they see grace as, as permission to continue in sin and go to heaven. So for them, grace is permission. It, it, it isn't God's rescuing love. It's not God giving to them something they don't deserve, but it, it's more a matter of them just receiving permission to continue, you know, doing what they do, whatever it may be, whether it's, you know, stealing, or whether it's, it's um, you know, sleeping around, whether it's getting drunk, what, what, you know, fighting, whatever. It's, it's, it's a permission to stay that way. And uh, a grace that does not change a man's behavior is not going to change a man's destiny. There needs to be something that changes. The Bible teaches that. Paul knew the facts. He's willing to kill people because he clearly knew the facts, but he didn't embrace them. But it took the Lord which it always does. John 16, 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Holy Spirit brings that conviction into your heart where you say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. He goes on, and, and this is the proper way, by the way, in verse 13 following, this is the proper way to give a testimony. And you're going to see how it is, and I'll, I'll show you this. He says, you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it, and I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia, returned again to Damascus. So he begins to give his testimonies. And, and, and it's interesting how he says this, you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. You've heard of it. I was famous for it. You're aware of what I was like. You've heard of my former conduct. So this is his testimony, he begins to share. He's saying, my message of grace does not run consistent with my history of Judaism. Uh, in Acts 22, in verse 4, he says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. So you've heard of the way that I was. You've heard of my former life. Sometimes when we hear testimonies, we can actually be enamored, perhaps, by all the sin that people get into. One of the things you really don't want to be around is a series of testimonies where all you get in that night is testimony night. And I'll tell you why. Because the first guy that comes up and says, you know, I, I did this and I, I drank and I, and I fought and I slept with a thousand women. Well, the next guy is going to come up and he says, I drank more, I fought more, and I slept with 2,000 women. You know, and that's what they do. And I've seen it. And before you know it, you've got a guy who slept with every woman in the world, basically, you know, because they exaggerate. They get, it's almost competition. Who was the worst slug, you know? Who was the crummiest person? And it gets kind of like that. Testimonies, when done properly, give you enough background information to know that this person understands because of where they came from. But they're intended, this is a very important point. If you're ever asked to give your testimony, the testimony is intended to bring glory to God, not admiration from other people saying, oh, man, that was one bad dude, or that was one sinful woman. You know, people get enamored by that to this day. 
Some people actually feel bad because they don't have a real rowdy testimony. I remember hearing a young lady who gave her testimony just before she was baptized. And she walked up and she said, after somebody who had just given their testimony, I was a drunk, I was into drugs, I did this, I got saved, bless the Lord, everybody cheers. And then she gives her testimony and she stands up there and she says, I don't really have a radical testimony. She was almost apologizing. She said, I was raised in a Christian home. I came to Christ at an early age. I've never done any of those things. I just know it's time for me to be baptized. And the wise pastor who was baptizing her turned to the congregation and said that the, uh, the keeping grace of God is just as glorious as the saving grace of God. And we need to understand that. I, I believe there are kids in the church today who think that, man, if I don't go out and do all the things that are bad and, and then later on come to Christ, I have no testimony. I'm telling you, I tried to raise my kids to not have the testimony I have. I don't want them to know the things. I didn't want them to know the things I discovered. I didn't want them to know what it was like to be what I was. I wanted them to be saved from that. You see, when you give a testimony, it gives glory to God. It's not centered on who you are and how bad you were. It's centered on how great He is. So Paul is speaking concerning this. He's saying, you've heard of me. You heard of what I was. I was a persecutor of the church to the death. You've heard of my former conduct. You've heard, notice verse 14, how I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation. I blazed a trail. That's what it means when it says I advanced. I blazed a trail. I, I cut down anything in my path in my quest for righteousness. I was a premier rabbinic student, and I had a zeal that was matchless. When he was speaking to the Philippians in chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, he said, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. And so that's the whole point. He said, I was zealous for the tradition of my fathers. I had a zeal, but not for the gospel. But, he says in verse 15, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to, to Damascus. So, now notice in verse 15, he says, when it pleased God, God's timing is, is spoken of here. I, I didn't respond to the gospel until Jesus met me on the road to Damascus. But notice how he says, who separated me from my mother's womb. Before I was born, God already had determined to save me, and God was gonna use me for his glory. It's an interesting scripture. Let me give you a couple of them. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, when God is calling this, this young man, a man by the name of Jeremiah, to, to, to his service, Jeremiah is going to be a prophet. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before you were even born, I was already planning on what I was going to do with you. Now, here's something for you. I want to be very clear about this. The things that went into your life that were horrible and terrible were not determined for you by God. In other words, God did not say, I want you to have all this pain and all this suffering. So I want to be very clear about that. It's not like God said, you know what? You're, I'm, I'm going to allow this to happen and you're going to have this happen because I want that for you. That's, that's not how it works. God's desire for us has always been for us to live in peace and love and joy and those are the things that God wants for us. Because of human sin and choices that are made, there are things that occur that have affected us terribly in our lives. And many of us went through a lot of pain and some may still be going through a lot of pain things that occurred in your life when you were growing up. 
maybe are still occurring to this day. That is not God's plan for you. He's not saying, oh, you're going to be hurt in this fashion. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to say. But even as Joseph once said in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. God has a way of taking the things of our lives that, that have pain, and God has a way of redeeming them. And, and in many ways, I have gained greater insight and understanding through just going through the life that I went through. I can now see, and I, if you don't mind, I'll get personal for a moment. I can now see some of the things that when I was young, I, I didn't see at all. Two things, if I may, that came into ministry, and I wasn't saved until I was 20. One is in my home, and I hope this makes some sense to you. In my home, when I grew up, my mom and my dad spoke fluent Spanish but didn't teach the kids to speak Spanish. They, they just didn't. It was their generation. They did not teach us to speak Spanish. The Spanish, the little I've learned has been just over time being around people who speak it because my parents did not teach it. So what happened is I would go see my grandmother who, who never spoke English. I never had a conversation with my grandmother. She only could speak broken English and she died in her 90s and never became an American citizen. My grandmother died a Mexican citizen. So she never spoke English and never had a group of people around her who didn't speak Spanish. So I, as a grandchild, would go to my grandmother's house and never had a chance to speak to my grandmother unless I had a translator. So my mom would sit at the table and would speak to grandma and I would, I'd have my conversations with my grandmother through my mom. So grandma would speak to me, and my mom would say, grandma wants to know how you're doing in school. And I'd say to my mom, tell grandma, mind her own business. And my, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> and mama, I'd say, oh, I'm doing fine, grandma. And mama would speak, and that, that's how it was. That's how it was. Now, I look back, at, and I say, I wish I were taught Spanish. My ministry would be just so much, it would there be so many more things I could do. But you know what happened? I learned to speak through a translator. And I can speak through translators. It's like a natural thing for me. And so I've gone to different, to Japan. You know, I've gone to, to India. Uh, I've spoken in various places, Germany, where, where I need a translator. And I sit there and I'll, I'll listen to the language and I get the cadence very quickly. And so I'm able to give sentences. In some places you speak short sentences. In other places you can speak long sentences. It just depends on the language. But I learned to do that when I was six years old, five years old, seven years old. And so that was part of my training for my future in ministry. I never understood it then, but I understand it now. There are things that you went through that you didn't even, it, you weren't even saved. I wasn't even saved at six or seven or eight or nine or ten or whenever I, yeah, but, but these were things that were going into, into uh, my life so that as I grew older, the Lord gave to me the ability to minister through these things. When, my, when I was growing up, Mama was ill. Mama still is to this day. That gave me a deep sense of compassion for people who are sick because of her illnesses. So when you see me tear up, it's because I've been with somebody who's ill all of my life. And so when I hear your pain, I can understand it. So those are things, excuse me, there's the emotion. I don't like it to come out, but it does. That's me. That's how I am. My dad used to say, David, you're too much of an open book. You got to close it up a little bit. But have I done that with you? No. What you see is what you get because that's just who I am. That's how it works. And so these are the things that the Lord brings into your life. In the life of Paul, Paul had certain things that went into the making of his life that led him to the place where he was a great believer in Christ. And so he said, you know what? God separated me from my mother's womb. God was involved in my life from the beginning. 
in the Psalms. In Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10, the psalmist said, You are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. And so the things that you go through, the Lord can redeem, and he can use them. And they make you actually an understanding counselor and a more loving person when it's salted with the grace of God. Now, he's making it very clear here, and I had to point this out. Notice how he said he called me through his grace. No person is placed into leadership except through the grace of God and through God's choice. So what Paul is doing here is establishing his call. He's saying, this is entirely of God. This is not my own effort. My calling was because of God's grace. He's saying, you cannot take this position through your effort, your desire, or your own skill. This is something God called me to, and the Judaizers are trying to take that position, a position that was given to him by God. He speaks in verse 16 about God revealing his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. God gave Paul life in Jesus, and Paul preached this life to others, including the Gentiles. In 1 John 5, 11, it says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. And so, so Paul would preach that life, this life that's in Jesus Christ, that you can have in no other way. And, and he's saying, I preach this life to the Gentiles. Now, after he got saved, notice verse 16, he said, to reveal his enemy that I might preach among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Uh, I, I didn't seek out the other apostles. I spent time with the Lord. I didn't go to Apostle 101 classes to become an apostle. He's saying, you know what? Man did not transform me. Man did not reveal Jesus to me. And man did not call me to preach. Man did not prepare me to preach the gospel. And man did not prepare me to fulfill my calling. This all comes from God. It starts with God, it continues with God, and it concludes with God. And I am to preach, he's saying, to the Gentiles, the matchless grace of God found in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, the Judaizers need to see that Gentiles don't need the law. Gentiles need grace, the way we all do. We need to walk in the grace of God. And we need... As believers, we need to rest entirely on the grace of God. My heart can condemn me, but God is greater than my heart, and he knows all things. There have been times when I have condemned myself. I've said, oh, you aren't saved. You can't possibly be saved. Look at how you're acting. Look at how you're living. Look at what you're doing. And I think, I, I think that every person in this room perhaps has had a moment at least like that where you've said, what happened to me? With that newness of life that when I got saved, I was so rejoiced, I was so glad, I was so happy. What happened to me? How did I get back into this place? I've done that in the past. But if it was by works and efforts, I'd have remained lost. It was the grace of God. I had to wake up to the reality that God knew me and he knew what I was when he called me. And even though he knew I was a mess up, even though he knew what I would do with the gospel, he still gave it to me and he still trusted me. And, and in that I rejoice and, and he still had the ability to work in me and he can work in you too. It's all by grace. It's all by his goodness. It's all by his love. It's all him. And to me, that's a very important thing to remember and to rest in all the time. When you, wake, when you walk away from the power of the Spirit of God in your life, guys, the results are always terrible. There's a guy named A.B. Simpson. Perhaps you've heard of him. He was a man who began a movement, the Christian Missionary Alliance Movement. In the late 1800s, he was a, a preacher who was from Canada. In the late 1800s, as a minister, he, 
He came into contact with God in a fresh way. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit and received the power of the Spirit in his life, transformed him. And he began to minister in the power of the Spirit in such a way that, that God was moving wonderfully. He went into New York City. And while there in Manhattan, he had a church. And the church was a good-sized church for the standards of that day in the late 1800s. And it sat 500 people, which is a good-sized church they have there in that city. We were in Manhattan this last week. And we went to a place called John's Pizza. And when we went into this place, it is advertised as having the largest pizza uh, seating area. There's 500 seats. And lo and behold, it's the former church pastored by A.B. Simpson. And I have pictures of this pizza hall with stained glass windows and balconies. And we're in there eating pizza, and there are people eating pizza, drink their beer, and, and it's just loud and rowdy. And, and, uh, and, and for me, it hits me as a minister of the gospel in a way that, that is a warning. Because if, if, if I don't walk in the spirit of God, and if this church doesn't remain in the grace of God, then one day this building that we're meeting in right here, this can be anything other than a church. It can be transformed into a, a, a playhouse for a chino. It can be anything. You see, 20-some years ago, we had an industrial building on Grove Street. It sat 120 people. We used to use it for offices and for Sunday and Wednesday night services. And we rented it, leased it for three years. So we had the Calvary Dove, and it said Calvary Chapel, and we had it on, on this industrial building. But after three years, we left that, and we got another piece of property. But I would drive by occasionally until they leased it out. And there on the side of the building was Calvary Chapel, but it became a manufacturing warehouse. And what at one time was a, a place that had 120 seats, Bible studies, worship of the Lord, offices, counseling, ministry, went right back into becoming an industrial building. This is an industrial building. That's all it is until the church arrives. But if we don't walk in the grace of God, this could become anything but a church. It's not hard for that to take place. And we need to understand that. And it all comes from God's grace. It all comes from us enjoying his love and his mercy. It all comes from our relationship with Jesus. And that's what Paul is speaking about. He's saying these people, these Judaizers, are going to come in and rip you off. They're going to take the joy of the Lord from you. You're going to get caught up in what you can do for God and forget what God has already done for you. You cannot outdo God. You cannot outgive God. Who has given to God first that God should owe him anything in return, Paul asked the Romans. And the answer is nothing. Who has first loved God before God loved him? No one. God has loved you first and God has given to you first because God cares about you. And all I need to do is understand that and my life is transformed. But if I get caught up with this idea, oh, okay, it's grace, but, but oh, I've got to stop doing this. And now let me tell you something. Now, this I'm taking a chance with. I stopped drinking a long time ago. I stopped drinking because I didn't want to anymore. Not because somebody said, oh, you can't drink. You don't think I can drink? You haven't ever seen me drink. I can drink. No, it wasn't one of those things at all. Oh, okay, now that you're, now that you're a Christian, you can't cuss anymore. One of my friends... My friend Bill told me, David, I know you're saved. I said, really, how do you know that? He says, you had a filthy mouth. And that's the truth. That's the truth. My coach in high school said, this is a quote, David is the quickest guy in school 
because I was in track. He's the quickest guy in school, but he has the foulest mouth I've ever heard on any, any kid. I used to swear every other word. And I got saved. And, and God changes your life. But it isn't because somebody said, okay, now that you're saved, you need to make sure you cut your hair and you need to make sure that you don't, you don't drink anymore and you don't, you don't smoke anymore and you don't, you don't cuss anymore. And when I fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, those things lost my interest. I don't need those anymore. I don't want those anymore. I wanted to be close to him. That's grace. But if you just said, okay, now you've got to do this and now you've got to do, okay, are you Christian? You better get up at six in the morning and you better make sure that you do your devotions because if you don't do your devotions at six in the morning, you aren't saved. Then I must not be saved because I'm not even awake at six in the morning. I, I'm, not even, I'm not awake most of the day. Don't get caught in traps. Don't be looking at somebody else saying, Oh, they do this, therefore, that's what real Christians do, and I got to do that too. If it doesn't fit, why wear it? If it doesn't fit, why wear it? Have your devotions, that's a good thing. Have your devotions when God can speak to you. Have your time with the Lord when it's you and God, not when somebody says, you need to do this and you need to read this many. Because let me tell you, I'll tell you one more personal thing. Hopefully this will glorify God. If not, we'll edit it from the tape. Marie and I are dating, and I go to Europe. I left her a page of scriptures to memorize. I was gone for three months. I come back. I go to see her, and I say to her, okay, did you memorize those scriptures? I mean, I just gotten home from Europe. And she says, uh, I tried. And I said, cool, what's 1 John 1, 9 say? Couldn't remember. Really, Romans 3.10, couldn't remember. Romans 3.23, couldn't remember. Hebrews 9.27, couldn't remember. I can tell you the scriptures I told her to memorize. I'm doing that right now. John 3.16, couldn't remember. So I look at her and I say, so what did you do for three months? You know what she did? She got up and cried. She still does. No, she got up and cried and, and left the room. And I'm sitting there with her roommate, and I say to her, what's with her? I mean, she's so upset about it. I had no clue. And her, her roommate's name was Joni, and Joni says to me, she's tried so hard, David. She's tried so hard. She's really been working on those scriptures all this time. And I walked into the room, and Marie was sitting on the bed crying. And I sat next to her, and I looked at her. I was puzzled as the day is long. And I'm looking at her. I go, I said, clue me in. Why are you crying? And I'll never forget this. She shook her head. She said, I tried. I tried. I just, I just couldn't do it. I, I, I couldn't do that. I just can't remember the way you wanted me to. The Lord spoke to my heart, and I've tried to learn this. And he said, she's not you. She's not you. Don't try and make her into you. She needs to be like me. Grace. God has been trying to teach me that for years. Let God work in people's hearts. Give them the word and encourage them. Love them. But let them rest in me. Grace. The Judaizers are saying, Okay, fine. You want to understand grace? You need to know law. And Paul was saying, you're stealing the joy from these people of salvation because the law is not required for salvation. Grace is. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. Now, when he says that God gave to me this message, I, I didn't spend time with flesh and blood. I spent time with the Lord. And I preached his grace. Notice in verse 17, he says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. I, I went to Arabia, returned again to Damascus. I, I did not sit under as a pupil the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not above me in authority. I did not seek advice or clarification from any men as to what the gospel meant. 
He said, I went to Arabia, which is a, a region that was east of Damascus. I returned again to Damascus. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and made my way to Chino and Ontario. And, and, as I, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which, are, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So after three years, uh, these are the periods of preaching in Damascus and his time in Arabia, he went to Jerusalem. And, and he established his ministry. He became acquainted with the apostle Peter, but he was only there for 15 days with him. That's too, too short a time to be instructed, that's the point. And he simply wanted to become familiar with the other apostles. But in verse 20, he calls God to be a witness in order to establish the truthfulness of his claim. And then he goes on to say, uh, verse 21, afterwards I went into the region of Syria, Cilicia. I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But, and this I want to close with, they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. The power of a transformed life. <laughs> he was so feared that when he originally was saved and he tried to join with the other believers, they didn't want anything to do with him. They were afraid of him. And it, it took Barnabas, son of comfort and encourager, to come alongside of the apostle Paul so that the others would finally accept him. That's how ferocious he was. That's how feared this man was ferocious and feared. But now the incredible transformation causes people to glorify God. The power of a transformed life. When my daddy came to Christ, he said to me, he said, I was not as good as your sister Madeline. My sister Madeline, as a teenager, stayed home. Uh, Friday night when all the kids wanted to go out, she would be sitting with mom and dad in the den with popcorn, watching movies. And she did that on Saturday and Sunday all the time. She never went out. She never caused a bit of problems to my dad. Her first boyfriend became her husband. I mean, she never, she didn't party, she didn't do crazy things, she was just a great girl. So my dad said, when you came and shared with me, I knew I was better than you, but I wasn't as good as your sister. And when your sister came to Christ, I knew that if someone that good needed Jesus, so did I. God has a way of using your life. I want you to walk out remembering one thing. When you walk in grace, you touch other people. Our, our, our lives are not intended to be simply, as A.B. Simpson said, reservoirs of the Spirit, but the Spirit is supposed to pour out of us. So God works within you, but he also splashes on others through you, your testimony in the neighborhood, your testimony in the family, your, your testimony on the job site, your way of life in school. It makes an impact. People watch you. They do see you. And Paul said, they knew what I was like. And then when they saw what God did, they glorified him in me. Do you want that kind of impact? 
I do. I do. I do. I want people, when, when I'm with them, I want people to say something about him. I want what he has. I have somebody in my life like that, Mike McIntosh. When I see Mike, I say, when I grow up, I want to be like that. He is a tremendous, tremendous example of a godly man. There are people in my life, Pastor Chuck and others like that. I want that impact because every one of us leaves an impression on somebody else. I just want to make sure the impression I leave glorifies God.